So hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center. Uh, and it's an honor and pleasure uh, to chair the session for today. Um, I invited Dr. Julia Falk, um, who first appeared on my radar as uh, an anthropologist uh, who did research into material culture. She has written very interesting pieces on kimono, on the material quality, on the smell, on how that creates a particular kind of inalienable um, uh, commodity uh, that can be passed down only in particular ways. And so as an anthropologist of Japan, obviously I thought that would be a brilliant um, topic uh, to uh, continue this lecture series. Now it turns out that Julie has turned her back on materiality uh, <laughs> almost <laughs> entirely. And she's now looking at something very exciting uh, and something uh, very new, or new at least uh, to me. I hope there's uh, quite a few of you who will be uh, familiar um, with these new interesting uh, financial instruments. So she is currently a, a postdoctoral research associate at the King's College's Business School, um, working on an ESRC funded project called an ethnographic investigation of crypto assets firms. And of course, her ethnographic focus has not changed, it's still on Japan. And the talk today is entitled From Early Adopter to Rigorous Regulator, The Case of Cryptocurrency in Japan. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Fabio, for that kind um, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to uh, share some of our research um, with you all. And um, for those of you who might be slightly puzzled by the trajectory of my research, um, in terms of my previous research with the kimono, I was also very interested in the kimono as a kind of uh, a specialized market. Um, uh, I was also very much interested, as Fabio said, in terms of the materiality, um, but it was these, this uh, focus on on specialized markets and um, specialized economic systems that uh, enabled me to make this um, transaction a tran transition into uh, the world of cryptocurrency. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen so you can all see my presentation. Um, I'll put it full screen mode and I hope that's all visible and clear for everybody. Uh, great. If it's not, if something changes, do let me know. I'll do my best to correct that. So um, as Fabio kindly introduced just now, uh, the topic of the talk today is um, the case of cryptocurrency in Japan and how Japan essentially um, transitioned from being an early enthusiastic adopter of all things crypto to a very uh, rigorous regulator that has chosen to do things in quite a specific way when it comes to regulating uh, cryptocurrency that, that reflects quite um, an interesting transition. So I'm going to be delving into that um, today. First of all, um, so this talk is drawn from a, an ongoing research project at the King's Business School, uh, more specifically at the Finwork Futures Research Center. And um, as Fabio just mentioned, the project is entitled Professional Hybridizations and Epistemic Practices of Crypto Capital, an Ethnographic Investigation of Crypto, crypto Asset Firms. So the project uh, is run by Professor Alexandru Prada and with Dr. Rowan Xu and myself on the team. Uh, Dr. Xu in particular looks at cryptocurrency in China and um, I look at the cryptocurrency landscape in uh, Japan. So in terms of our methodology, so for you to have an idea of how we approach what we do, um, you might think that uh, the world of finance, the world of cryptocurrency lends itself very much to quantitative investigations, the production of statistics. And of course, you would be right, but it also very much lends itself to uh, qualitative investigations. So we're rather than just trying to produce say uh, raw data on um, rates and you know, market volumes and liquidity and so on. Um, we're very much interested in the lived experience of what it means to work in a cryptocurrency firm, what it means to be part of a project uh, that is essentially emerging in, um, in the financial landscape 
and the kinds of professional identities that are forged uh, in that process and also the types of expertise that are being built in this emerging field. So that's really our kind of our North Star, if you will, when we um, approach this project. We're uh, funded by the ESRC, very um, thankful to, to the ESRC for uh, the funding we receive. Um, as I touched on just now, our project is multi-sited, um, which is unsurprising given that the, the, the project is cryptocurrency and um, this is essentially something of a global project. Um, and what's very interesting about it is it looks quite different depending on where you are um, in the world, despite it having this global perspective. And that's something that's at the crux of the talk today that I'll be coming back to again and again. Um, we have some um, partners in Japan who uh, have given us a lot of research support, uh, in particular the um, University of Hitotsubashi and Professor Takahiro Endo in particular. And we've also have um, partners in the cryptocurrency world, in particular the Japan Virtual Currency Exchange Association and uh, the Japan Cryptocurrency Business Association who've been very supportive of our project as well. And uh, I'll be um, talking about them um, a bit more later on in the talk as well. So uh, a couple of disclaimers first, just so you know sort of how we situate um, our, our work and at what stage the project is, 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 is in. So the research project began in 2020. Um, myself and Dr. Shu were recruited onto the project in 2021, and the project is due to conclude in mid-2023. And um, as you're probably not surprised to find out, we've yet to be able to conduct research in Japan due to uh, COVID-19, of course, and uh, the associated travel restrictions. Um, as some of you probably know, uh, it's, it's currently still quite difficult to get to travel to Japan, to get into Japan. So we're, uh, we're biding our time and, and doing some planning for that. I'll talk about that a bit later on in the talk as well. Uh, we've done some interviews remotely um, and we've done some desk research for data as well. And we hope to be able to conduct fieldwork in Japan in, in, in January and February 2022. So fingers crossed that we're able to do that and we actually get our hands on a little bit more data. So in terms of the, um, where this talk is drawn from, uh, it's drawn from this preliminary uh, research and this preliminary investigation, and it's drawn from the outline of a paper on uh, regulatory frameworks and cryptocurrency exchanges in Japan and the particularities of this system in Japan. But it's very much still a work in progress. So um, comments and critiques uh, are very much welcome. Uh, the, um, as a result of this talk. So um, also in terms of why we are motivated to do this, this research and why we're motivated specifically to look at Japan, um, it's very topical, of course. Um, the current sort of landscape the, the, with cryptocurrency, something I'm going to mention a bit later, um, obviously is, is, seems to be gaining a lot of momentum, seems to be growing um, and it's obviously something that is interesting in terms of how it could potentially transform existing financial um, infrastructure and the way we understand um, issues related to money, issues related to value um, and so on. So um, very important, we believe, to have these kind of qualitative perspectives that allow us to see what people are thinking and how they're acting and what they're doing inside of this, this emerging field. And that's why, of course, we, we believe in having this qualitative um, framework rather than a pure you know, quantitative analysis. And we also currently find that the, in terms of academic conversations, um, we hope to be able to produce um, and contribute to academic conversations in terms of exploring professional, the professional identities of people who work in cryptocurrency firms and the types of expertise that they're currently producing in a field that is uh, really quite new. And so when it comes to Japan, um, Japan, or well, without giving away too much um, at the beginning of the talk, Japan occupies quite a unique position in the cryptocurrency world. So in terms of um, being able to, 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 to say more about this um, and you know, explain why Japan is in this position and where they go from here, 
is um, strategically quite important for the uh, global cryptocurrency perspective. So uh, just a quick overview of the contents of uh, today's talk. So um, we assume when we talk about our project, we assume no prior knowledge on the part of our audience um, in terms of what sort of cryptocurrency is, how it works. So I'm going to talk you all through a little bit of the basics. Um, and it's, it's an interesting position for us to be in as, as researchers, because with any given audience, uh, unless we know for sure that this is people who are specialized in blockchain or cryptocurrency, um, we don't know if, I, I, for instance, I don't know if some of you, for example, you may have cryptocurrency, you may be interested in F NFTs, you may have uh, a wallet, you may have all sorts of things that are related to cryptocurrency. And then there might be um, those of you for whom uh, cryptocurrency is just something you see in the news and you're, and, and um, that is something you're, you're curious about, but you um, don't really have any direct experience. So to make sure everyone's on the same page, what we like to do is just a little bit of a, um, a recap on the, the, the kind of fundamentals of, of blockchain and cryptocurrency. And um, I'll also walk you through the current landscape for cryptocurrency in Japan, uh, who the most likely user of cryptocurrency in Japan is, and explain how the regulatory framework emerged, which is in response to a number of high profile hacks of cryptocurrency exchanges and how regulation developed, the potential issues with regulation and what is at, the, at its core, what I find very interesting anthropologically about this reaction is what it tells us about Japanese attitudes to technology um, and how uh, the Japanese government in particular um, perceives technology and this, this, this type of technological growth and the potential, also the potential risks that it presents. And then finally, I'll tell you about the next steps for our research and uh, where we hope to go from here. So I hope that's that's all clear for everyone. Um, first of all, blockchain. So um, blockchain and cryptocurrency tend to go together. So it's one of those one of those words that may seem a little opaque and a little difficult to understand at first, but it's actually a lot simpler than it seems. Um, the best way to think about blockchain, particularly if you're not uh, a, a technical expert, is to think of it as a type of database. So um, if you imagine a normal, a sort of normal inverted commas database, you can imagine it a little bit like an Excel spreadsheet. So you, you have, as data is entered, it's logged in sequence and it looks a little bit like that. Um, but instead of being like a spreadsheet, uh, blockchain is exactly what it sounds like. It's a chain of blocks. So uh, what happens is instead of when the data comes in, instead of being entered into the cells of a, a spreadsheet, um, it's stored in blocks that are then chained together. So if you imagine the data coming in to, 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 to a block, it turns into a fresh block. Once the, this block is filled, it's then chained on to the previous block, which very importantly creates chronological order. That's, that's quite a key characteristic. Um, it's not especially new technology, actually. It's been around for a while, but it's really with cryptocurrency that it's sort of come into, come into its own. And this is why it's, it's sort of come into its own because the main use that's been found for it is as a ledger for transactions. So essentially as recording transactions that have occurred with cryptocurrency. And um, at its heart, so one of the things that's very, what we think very interesting and quite crucial to remember with the inventions of blockchain and cryptocurrency is these are inventions that are their heart technological rather than financial. And um, it was brought about by people who are very technically and technologically minded. And that's what makes it interesting when you try to integrate these things into existing financial infrastructures that may not be necessarily so friendly to them. Um, and one of the key elements, one of the key things that is part of the whole ideal of cryptocurrency is um, the blockchains are used to build a decentralized system. So the idea behind it is that no single person has control over the blockchain and all users have control over the blockchain. And um, I'll explain in, a, in, the next, in the next slide why that is. Um, 
but the other element to remember as well is that um, on decentralized blockchains, um, nothing can be entered, nothing can be um, altered, sorry, once the data is entered. So what this means is your ledger for transactions is, uh, the, the transactions are recorded permanently and are viewable to anyone. So the idea being that you create a lot of transparency by using a blockchain. So this has some interesting repercussions, however, because it means you have tr transparency, but uh, not necessarily privacy because people can see essentially what has happened and how the transaction occurred. So um, this presents, as you can imagine, some, some, uh, some problems when you want to try and integrate that, for example, into uh, existing financial infrastructure, as a lot of industries are now um, considering how they might be able to do that. Uh, now moving on to cryptocurrency, uh, now that we've had a bit of a, a look at blockchain. So cryptocurrency is best thought as a type of digital asset, which is uh, based on a network distributed across many computers. And it belongs to a decentralized structure outside of the control of central authorities that relies on blockchain technology. So when I said before that cryptocurrency and blockchain is something of an idealistic project, this is in fact why it is an idealistic project because the, the idea is essentially to, to bypass existing financial centralized infrastructures such as um, banks, for instance. So the idea that you can make peer-to-peer uh, transactions without relying on a gatekeeper in the middle. That is essentially the point um, of a cryptocurrency. And the word itself comes from the type of encryption that's used to secure the network, uh, cryptography. And in terms of how cryptocurrency is made, um, typically, although some of, the, some of them may evolve to, to, to not do this, but for the time being, it's best to think of it in this way, as um, let's use the example of Bitcoin, is generated through a process called mining. And a lot of you I'm sure have heard this term, but what it means essentially how the transaction is processed, how uh, people are able to make transactions is a process through which um, the computers on the network have to solve problems in order to verify the transaction. So this is how the system operates without its intermediary, without someone in the middle saying, okay, this transaction is legitimate, I will, I will pass it through. So um, this is essentially uh, how, how it functions. And um, because the, um, the problems that, the, that people have to solve, that the miners have to solve, the computers have to solve, become increasingly complicated, they require more and more uh, power, which is why, um, some of these networks are not environmentally friendly. Um, and that leads me on to my next point, which is the criticism that cryptocurrencies face. Um, so the environmental impact is one of them, but also their um, alleged use in illegal activities because of the fact that, you know, you can circumvent uh, banks, for instance, um, and also the exchange rate volatility. Um, cryptocurrencies are characterized by having very volatile uh, rate changes, um, which obviously is, is risky for, for people who invest in them. And also the underlying uh, vulnerability of blockchain infrastructure um, and other elements of, of cryptocurrency infrastructure that can mean it's quite vulnerable to, um, to outside attacks. So lots of reasons why um, cryptocurrencies do still face uh, criticism. Just a couple of examples, um, really just the two, two, more, two most famous ones uh, among cryptocurrencies. Um, the, these are, I'm sure you will have heard of both, but there are actually a lot more now and um, they sort of tend to proliferate. And this is, this is uh, one of the things that's quite interesting to bear in mind with, with uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain is that people can essentially launch them and make them and start them. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a kind of wild west of, of um, new finance, if you will. People can sort of can produce these things and they can proliferate. But the two that are sort of uh, kind of the leader of the pack, if you will, are Bitcoin and Ethereum. So Bitcoin is the first. It was launched in 2009 um, by uh, a figure called Satoshi Nakamoto, 
uh, now uh, we don't actually know if that's the real name. It's a pseudonym. It could be several people. We don't actually know. So the point of Bitcoin was to be an alternative to national currencies. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it was, it's a very technological project in and of itself rather than a financial one. Um, and it has um, at its heart this idea that you can make these peer-to-peer -peer transactions that don't rely on central authorities. Later on, uh, in 2015, we have Ethereum. And Ethereum is um, essentially supposed to be an, an improvement on Bitcoin. And the reason why, without sort of getting too technical, is it has a built-in scripting language of its own and a distributed virtual machine called um, EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. And really the only thing to remember from this is that it enables smart contracts. And smart contracts have um, the potential to enable all sorts of things on the blockchain. Um, in particular, how to, uh, they have the potential to change um, legal, financial, and social agreements. And potentially as well, they have the um, potential to be able to sort of demonstrate your identity online as well. So they have function, so, so the Ethereum network has, has um, the potential to have all sorts of fun new functionalities. And this is very much what we see now is, is at the level of potential um, in terms of what people are kind of trying to do with it. A lot of um, the financial world and other industries as well as sort of looking at these, these what the possibilities are for these, um, this type of technology. So what we're, what we're looking at really is, 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 is um, this, this, this emerging field where people are sort of standing a little bit on the brink, kind of looking over to see, see where things go and they're not entirely sure where things go yet. So it's a very interesting thing to be um, looking at because the, 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 the contours of the landscape essentially are still quite blurred in terms of what we might be able to do and what things might look, look like in the future. Um, if these functionalities become a bit more ingrained in our existing technological infrastructure. So a little bit more of a word now on our sort of current crypto and blockchain space. Where are we now in terms of development? Um, this is sort of important in order for people to, to be able to situate Japan later so that you have an idea of kind of where, you know, where we are in the in, in the strides that are being made. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the popularity of Bitcoin um, inspired uh, people then to go on and make different um, cryptocurrencies, in particular Ethereum in 2015. And there are now lots of different cryptocurrencies, lots of different chains and networks as well. So it's not just the two of them. Um, it's now safe to consider cryptocurrencies as a major asset class. And the notional value is of uh, $1.77 trillion, so pretty significant, and that's as of March of this year. Uh, we also see investments being made by publicly listed companies, such as Tesla. And we find that across the board, major financial institutions are becoming more open to cryptocurrency related services. Um, so, as I mentioned before, this sort of standing a little bit on the edge, kind of looking over, trying to see what, what they can do and how they can, how they can use these things. And um, this is also ushered in what we call decentralized finance, uh, also known as DeFi, you might have seen this word. Um, and this is where various different types of financial products are available on decentralized public, net, uh, public blockchain networks. So we've seen the, the growth of this as well. And we've also seen the, the NFT boom. You've probably seen NFTs in, in the news uh, at the very least this year. They've been somewhat inescapable. Um, so NFTs very quickly are non-fungible tokens. Uh, non-fungible simply means that they cannot sort of be traded like for like the way you could uh, trade Bitcoin like for like. One Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin, but um, an NFT uh, is not. It's not interchangeable. And um, they have their own unique identification codes. And as I said, they can't be traded at equivalency. And what we've seen they're used so far is mainly in collectibles, uh, gaming and art as well. So that's mainly where we've seen their application uh, being, being used. 
Um, so what all this has led to, it's led to uh, now sort of talk of it, we're entering a sort of web 3.0 phase potentially. Uh, there's been some comparison made to um, early stages of mass adoption of the internet in terms of this sort of teetering feeling of sort of, you know, do we use this? How do we use this? Do we sort of use it on a grand scale? How is that possible? Um, so we see this kind of talk quite a lot. But it's important to bear in mind there's a, there's sort of multiple issues as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the extreme volatility uh, problem for cryptocurrencies, the question of whether mass adoption is really um, achievable. We, we do consider there to be uh, certain barriers for entry to become um, sort of financially and technologically literate enough to, to be able to use cryptocurrency. Um, so those barriers for entry certainly exist. Um, and also the question of how far integration with an existing centralized finance is possible, whether it's desirable, how it would work in the first place, um, those sorts of questions. And then of course, uh, security and um, regulation as well. So multiple issues there. So you might be thinking, um, you know, this is all very well and good to sort of magic uh, a kind of currency out of the air with technology and just sort of run with it. And um, what what happened? What do you do with regulation? How do you regulate something like that? So that's a very good question. And it's something that's going to be important when we talk about Japan and Japan's approach to regulation as well. Um, but to give you an idea, sort of generally speaking, what regulation has looked like is that there's nothing standardized across the world as of yet. So there's no standard standardized regulatory system. And what this means is we're in an interesting situation where the very cryptocurrencies themselves have different, are, are classified as different objects, different things, depending on where you are in the world. And that means they're also taxed in different ways across the world. So we are essentially in a situation where the law is uh, well, the regulatory system, I should say, is less, is, has yet to catch up essentially to the reality of, of cryptocurrency and sort of produce these things. So to give you some examples, um, China was, was very much the, the, the world leader in terms of uh, cryptocurrency mining and exchanges, but has now uh, essentially banned anything to do with crypto, including exchanges and mining operations. So the world's largest uh, cryptocurrency exchange, a crypto ex ex a cryptocurrency exchange being a place where cryptocurrency can be traded, um, both for other cryptocurrencies and for what we call fiat currency, which is standard uh, currencies like uh, the pound and the dollar. So this, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, was initially launched in China, but has since relocated to uh, the Cayman Islands in 2017, but originally it's a, a Chinese project. Meanwhile, in the US, we have uh, a system, we have basically a situation where there's no regulatory framework. So different uh, bodies in the US have referred to cryptocurrencies very differently as securities, as commodities, as currencies. So there's, there's uh, legal classifications vary depending on who is talking. Um, other countries have done sort of radical experiments. So in Venezuela, for instance, has decided to link its currency to Bitcoin. But that's uh, essentially for several reasons. Um, essentially, the, the, the currency of Venezuela, the Bolivar, can be considered pretty much worthless at this point and um, is, is in that kind of situation making you know, experimentations of, of this nature are, you know, it's a little bit easier to, 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 to do. Um, and so that's sort of uh, a, a, another kind of extreme end of the spectrum. Um, Japan is generally understood as having quite a progressive stance um, with regards to cryptocurrency, uh, but it balances that with a requirement uh, for exchanges to meet some very strict standards. So Japan is quite a, an interesting take on the whole thing, and we'll, we'll delve into that a bit more. But first, a sort of glance, you know, in terms of how we want to situate Japan, in terms of who is likely to use crypto. This, this chart is drawn from a Statista Global Consumer Survey. Uh, it's available for everyone to use, as you can see down below. Um, and um, this, what this shows us is an interesting distribution of countries 
in terms of who said they're most likely to use or own uh, crypto. We have Nigeria at the top with 32%, and Vietnam and the Philippines and Turkey following on. And then towards the, and then at the bottom, we have um, developed economies, the US, Germany, and Japan. Japan uh, last at 4%. So uh, what we could call a low adoption rate. So these are quite sort of interesting um, statistics to, to, to bear in mind. I'm going to explain um, a little bit why in a minute. But if we contrast it with this particular chart, so this is where investors earned the most from Bitcoin in 2020. So this is now focusing specifically on Bitcoin. Uh, so we have the US at the top, then China, then Japan at $0.9 billion. And uh, the um, developed, uh, the developing, sorry, developing economies are nowhere to be seen on this chart. So what does this mean? So this means that adoption and uh, profit are not necessarily linked and the crypto assets usage varies widely from, uh, so for example, when we remember before what we had with um, Nigeria and other developing nations is that peer-to-peer -peer transactions are very appealing in countries that maybe have less fit, uh, stable financial infrastructure or that have quite strong barriers to being able to transfer money internationally. That means that a system where you have no intermediary is very appealing because then you're much more in control of your, of your finances, um, essentially, and being able to have some more direct control. Whereas um, in countries with established and quite regulated financial infrastructures and um, developed economies is much more skewed towards uh, investing rather than actual direct usage and adoption. So what we tend to find is this, this you know, diverging landscape in terms of where you are in the world. So um, these, this leads to some quite interesting data about who uses and who invests. Um, and so cryptocurrency exchanges tend to now, what well, we, we can think of them at the very least as key players. Um, and because they're the ones that uh, essentially enable cryptocurrency to be traded and they are there at the heart of what we saw before this, um, this, this landscape of profit through uh, investing and trading cryptocurrency. So they are very important in that process. And um, this has been pretty key in, in the development of the cryptocurrency market in, in Japan in particular. And so regulation continues to present a pretty significant legal challenge. Um, and it really, exposes what we could consider to be the ongoing paradox of the project of blockchain and cryptocurrency itself, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a technological advance at its heart. So the idea being to make these uh, forms of payment accessible to, to, um, to anybody free from institutional oversight. Uh, but of course, as we know, our financial infrastructures, the existing ones, the traditional ones don't really work like that, they're regulated. They belong to different jurisdictions. They, they um, are, are grounded in a sort of existing social, political, and economic reality. So how do you go about integrating these things and making these things work together is, is a bit of a, a paradox. So a little bit sort of um, like oil and water, if you will. So this, this is an, an interesting thing to observe, this tension. Um, and it's important to bear in mind, finally, from this sort of takeaway slide, um, that while I'm focusing mainly on cryptocurrency exchanges in this talk, the, the kind of blockchain world in inverted commas does extend uh, beyond cryptocurrency and into DeFi, uh, decentralized finance, which I mentioned um, as well. So there's a, there's a sort of world beyond the, the, the exchanges, um, but for the sake of simplicity and brevity, we're focusing mainly on, on exchanges today. So finally, Japan. Um, what is the landscape for cryptocurrency in Japan? Um, so Japan very early on demonstrated its um, world-renowned pro-technology side and emerged early on as an adopter of Bitcoin um, to such an extent actually that at one time, so early, 
um, to, to mid, even to late 2010s, um, Japan dominated the trading market. And in January 2018, for instance, the yen accounted for 56.2% of the Bitcoin market. Um, so that is a pretty sizable chunk. Japan was a very important market, remains uh, an important trading market, especially for Bitcoin. And despite some very high profile cryptocurrency exchange hacks as well. That being said, there's quite a lack of diversity in the trading landscape in Japan. So in 2021, um, Bitcoin still represents 77% of the trading landscape with Ethereum at about 8%. So um, when we consider actually how Ethereum has grown and become so important in the last few years, um, this, is, this is still quite a small um, percentage. And so this is very investing and trading um, based. And what we see is that despite there being several initiatives by companies and some government led initiatives as well, the actual usage of cryptocurrency in Japan is low. If you remember that statistic from before, it's around 4%. Um, so the, there's still this question of sort of adoption and whether things really remain purely kind of at the level of, of in, in, um, investment. Um, there's a number of reasons for this uh, that I'll come back to later in the talk. Uh, the one I put here is sort of cultural preferences for, for cash. Um, this, is, uh, this is pretty strong still in Japan, as, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, in, in 2019, cashless payments in Japan accounted for 26.8% of payments. Um, this is thought to have increased now. Uh, we have indications that it has primarily in some part anyway to do with COVID-19 and the appealing nature of cashless payment for, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so it has increased a little bit, but it still remains um, fairly low. And there's also the perceived lack of safety of cryptocurrency as well, um, something I'll come back to as well later in the talk. So who is uh, the most likely user in, in Japan? So this is drawn primarily from this paper, the, the um, title of which I put at the top of this, this slide. Um, this is something we hope to, to, to verify as well when we actually go to Japan next year and talk to users too. Um, but we think this, this data is, is, um, is pretty likely to, to check out. Um, crypto asset owners in Japan, quite likely to be, to be male and to be aged below 30 years. Uh, the authors of this paper found this to be congruent with other countries like the US, Canada and Austria. Um, owners tend to have higher pre-tax income. They tend to work in private or public companies and be self-employed. They're also likely to have experience investing in um, conventional risky assets, conventional risky financial assets. Um, and Japanese owners tend to have uh, objective financial literacy and also the experience of financial education at school. And um, this, is, this, this, this comes back to this question of uh, barriers for entry, for instance, and the kinds of literacy financial and technological that you need in order to be able to um, access the world of, of uh, cryptocurrency, in particular, if you want to invest. So having uh, access to this, essentially having access to objective financial literacy um, is, is pretty important uh, and tends to separate out who tends to then go on to be a user. Uh, that being said, um, Crypto asset users and owners tend to get uh, inf information on um, finance and on cryptocurrency from, the, from mass media, but they also have their own preferred knowledge and information sources when they select financial products. And this is something we, we observe um, with cryptocurrency. A lot of information tends to happen and be shared on social media. Um, this can be particular, particularly the case with specialized products like NFTs, where um, a lot of information is shared on channels uh, like Twitter, but also Discord, um, to a certain extent Reddit as well, Telegram too. So it does require having a certain literacy in terms of using social media as well. 
Um, and uh, so younger millennials and Gen Z tend to be um, quite literate when it comes to these, these um, social media channels as well. So that's um, relatively unsurprising. Um, they also tend to display confidence about financial literacy. Um, there's a suggestion that they can make decisions quite quickly, um, having drawing on their literacy in these various fields to judge based on reputation uh, in selecting their products. And they tend to possibly be less risk averse, possibly more impulsive than non-owners as well. And they're also more likely, and this is unsurprising, to be open to using non-cash payment methods as well. So um, broad strokes, this is sort of kind of what we could expect uh, a likely user to, um, to, to, to look like in, in Japan. And also something we hope to investigate in a little bit more depth when we, when we go next year. Uh, just see there's some questions in the chat I might. Just check that that's uh, okay. That's that's not for me. I was just checking that there was some something that might not be sort of audio or something like that. Just checking. Um, so yes, so some high-profile hacks in Japan. This is this is um, important because this is what leads essentially to the type of regulation that uh, is in place in Japan, um, and. Japan has seen some actually some of the most uh, serious um, serious hacks um, in 2014 in particular with uh, one of the defining hacks in the history of cryptocurrency actually Mt. Gox, um, the which was at the time the largest cryptocurrency exchange. Um, there was a hack that resulted in the loss of um, 450 million. Um, which uh, was a sort of a little bit of a wake-up call in on a, on a global on a global scale. Um, in 2018, CoinCheck. This is another cryptocurrency exchange was hacked, uh, resulting in the loss of um, about 530 million dollars. Uh, there was another hack in 2018 uh, with the tech bureaus Zafe, and in 2019, Bitpoint, and in 2021, Liquid. So um, this might seem like a pretty high frequency of hacks, and it is. And this is linked to what I mentioned before, which is that, that um, the existing infrastructure is, um, remains quite weak. So, well, weak is a strong word, but um, it, 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 has some, it has some vulnerabilities, essentially, that can be exploited. Um, that being said, this might seem quite alarming to, to um, a, a sort of an outsider to, to cryptocurrency. But in the crypto world itself, attitudes can, to hacks can be actually surprisingly relaxed because they've been so much a part of the project right from the start that, uh, that people are actually quite used to it. Um, so, so there's a sort of a bit of a different mentality when it comes to that in the, in, in, in the crypto space. But obviously Japanese authorities have, have a different perspective on this entirely because their motivation is to protect the investor and protect the consumer. Um, so it's one thing to welcome change. It's another thing when it starts to threaten your consumers. Um, so what does this produce? So the regulation in response to the hacks. So uh, first of all, on a sort of international scale, there was a financial action task force that created the guidance to risk-based approaches to cryptocurrencies in 2015. And they recommended that countries license cryptocurrency exchanges under the same rules as other financial institutions. Um, this is something that was very much taken to heart in Japan. Um, in particular, the Mt. Gox and also later on the CoinCheck um, hacks encouraged the Japanese government to draft a, st a strategy for cryptocurrency governments. And one of the, the changes that's been hailed as being quite uh, progressive in Japan was the revision of the Payment Services Act, which then legally defined cryptocurrency as a form of payment. Um, so while crypto assets are not treated as money, um, it's not legal tender, but it can be used as a payment system. So that's been um, that's something that's characteristic of the, of, of the Japanese regulatory system. Um, 
the law requires that cryptocurrency exchanges be registered with the financial services uh, agency. And what that means is compliance with um, the same sorts of rules other financial institutions have to comply with. So this means uh, anti-money laundering, it means auditing, it means filing business reports, it means um, KYC, which is know your customer, which prevents um, um, trading being, being used for nefarious purposes, asset management, um, custody, and so on. Um, this means that registering as an exchange is necessary, but it's also quite a long uh, process. It can take up to six months. We've also seen uh, recently a terminology shift in Japan. Uh, so from the word cryptocurrency to crypto assets. So the original word in Japan was Ango Tsuka, um, and that has then now been shifted to Ango Shisan, reflecting the shift from currency to, um, to asset. We've also seen the enhancement of uh, custody services and the tightening of regulations governing exchange services and governing crypto asset derivative transactions. So uh, Japan has a self-regulatory body, the JVCA, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, and exchanges have to answer to this body and they're required to uh, regulate themselves quite thoroughly. And they're required to govern themselves to fit the tight restrictions such as know your customer and anti-money laundering um, restrictions as well. So um, very nigh on impossible to operate in Japan as an exchange without these, these sorts of regulations, um, which is in contrast with other non-regulated exchanges, for example, Binance, which is the most, uh, the largest um, cryptocurrency exchange in the world. And so the, the associations in Japan tend to work together. So the self-regulatory body, the JDCA, works together with the, um, the JCBA, the Japan Crypto Asset Business Association. So this is generally how, how exchanges tend to be able to uh, share information, design strategies, um, and possibly influence, sort of try, to, try to influence the government as well. Influence is more, it's more in terms of trying to um, see where they can, they, can, they can possibly help the government to make things a little bit less um, restrictive as well, uh, particularly in terms of, of taxation, for instance. Um, and the question of, of, of regulation, sort of linked to my previous points in terms of how um, this can essentially restrict what people can do, um, this has been something of, atten of attention right from the start, and it's something of attention for a lot of things to do with technology. And actually, the, in the origins of the Internet project itself, um, you know, in terms of how, how, how do you impose regulations when you're making something that's um, so, so new? So when you don't have regulation, uh, what it does allow for is, is sort of innovation and change. Um, but it can also mean less uh, security and less um, oversight as well. So um, in, in the Japanese case, the authorities ended up choosing regulation in order to protect the customers because they were quite alarmed at the, 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 the scale of the hacks. Um, the problem is, is actually can't fully insulate exchanges from hacking because the, the underlying infrastructure has its, has its um, fragility. So um, we do see that even post-regulation, the hacks continue to happen. Um, but it does protect in other areas, such as some of the potential risks related to money laundering uh, and so on. So this question of regulation in Japan, um, it's allowed for the creation of a pretty solid status quo. And, it's, and it helps to a certain extent, at least secure Japan's position globally in um in the trading market as we saw before in the in the chart japan has this pretty solid um status in in terms of investment and trading so um so we see this solid yen bitcoin trading market but growing beyond that has started to look um difficult uh in terms of in terms of the regulations so um there's uh, and this this presents some some problems for what the other areas that I mentioned decentralized finance as well um, in terms of growth in those areas utilizing the functions of not just blockchain but also smart contracts on the Ethereum network um, these sorts of things will 
tend to come into collision with the regulatory system in, in Japan. So the question of future growth um, is, is, is sort of called a little bit into question by these regulations. So um, this leads to the questions of what are, what are the factors, the other factors that are at play here. Um, now I would suggest, and this is something that I'd be very interested in everyone's input, is the question of Japan's um, attitude towards technology. So um, one of my hypotheses is this um, duality, this ambivalence towards technology. Um, and on the one hand, a very pro-innovation side, a very pro-technology side in Japan, but also uh, a side that is actually a little, I mean, anti-technology might be strong, but a little more reluctance to adopt technology. So we see this demonstrated in other areas in Japan, such as the slowness to adopt smartphones, uh, the reluctance to abandon fax machines. If anyone has ever worked in Japan, you I'm sure you'll have encountered a fax machine. Um, and obviously the attachment to cash as well. Um, but then we also see other things such as being the, uh, the pioneers of technological development in the past, robotics obviously, and being among the earliest promoters and believers in Bitcoin. So we see this ambivalence. And um, with, as we know, the government tends to lean towards a slightly more conservative attitude towards these types of, of, um, uh, of innovation and change, particularly where customer safety is, is sort of, uh, 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 in, in the balance. Um, and so I would, my hypothesis is that this landscape of cryptocurrency in Japan is, is emblematic of this ambivalence. And um, so all this becomes really particularly relevant when you place Japan, not just in the global context, but in its own immediate regional context, comparing it to other Asian countries where, for example, contactless payments are, are much more common. Um, and, and we see this, um, this possibly this ambivalence towards technolo technology, distinguishing um, Japan a little bit from, from its neighbors. Um, and so cryptocurrency exchanges, they do hope to provide um, a way in which Japanese investors could diversify their portfolio. Um, but this, this is still something that sort of remains in, in, in question a little bit with the existing regulations um, that, we, that we have. I would say another factor, culturally speaking, uh, and I guess a sort of uh, a kind of paradox or a tension at the very least that, that is difficult to resolve is um, the question of anshin. So some of you might be familiar with this word. Um, anshin is quite difficult to translate. It can mean um, sort of being, being at ease, feeling sort of confident in something, feeling uh, reassured in, um, in something. So this is something that uh, some of you, I'm sure, will have seen in promotional material in Japan, um, reassuring customers that they're, the product that they're buying or that the investment they're making is safe. And um, so being able to secure and provide Anshin is a pretty important marketing tool in Japan and um, is something that will, culturally speaking, I, I, I believe, influence the authorities in terms of the choices that they would make. And they're also aware of the expectations that customers expect security. And aside from this, I guess, a pool of investors who are happier to make riskier investments, there's still quite a negative image publicly that's been left by hacks in Japan, more broadly speaking. So. Um, this makes it a little bit more difficult to promote the project more broadly speaking beyond investors. So this is one of the factors I, I think that underpins this strong customer protection policy. But the flip side of that is, as I mentioned before, if you place Japan in its regional context, is this fear of being left behind with regards to um, fintech and um, this, the emerging financial world. So. Uh, in particular, in, in comparison to South Korea and China. Um, but we do see that as of now, the uh, conservative, or at least the cautious approach of the, of, of the Japanese government doesn't really seem set to change. And I should, I should caveat this by saying that this, the, the regulatory system in Japan has been seen as a model to emulate because it allows for 
um, a regulated but healthy financial ecosystem. Um, it just doesn't allow so much for the kind of wilder types of innovation that you would see in other parts of the world. So it's a it's it's um, it's a balancing act. That essentially, you you see every country trying to tread in its own way and is very um, revelatory uh, for us as social scientists in terms of how countries approach questions related to um, how we add value to society through technology or how we understand and perceive risk, the levels of comfort with risk and how these particular financial enclaves um you know drive drive these forces and and their own you know inner community understanding of of, of risk and value as well and how these are different in a, in a, in in different parts of the world as well so um this is the last couple of slides for the talk um so the questions now for us is sort of what now um where do we where do we take this um and what do we hope to to do next year, what do we hope to achieve? Uh, what sort of data do we hope to bring back? Um, so as I mentioned, we want to do some field work in January and March um, of next year. Uh, we will be um, supported in a non-financial capacity, in a research capacity by the JVCA and the JCBA, as well as um, Hitosubashi University as well. So what we want to do is conduct interviews with cryptocurrency traders, market makers, auditors, computer scientists as well, regulators and management as well. We hope to have sort of 30 plus interviews. Um, it depends on people's level of comfort as well in terms of uh, COVID and really if the situation um, hopefully is conducive to us being able to do that. I, in an ideal scenario, what we would like to do is conduct participant observation inside cryptocurrency exchanges too. So being able to actually visit it and be based within the exchanges um, as well. Um, we also hope to explore beyond crypto, cryptocurrency and look at blockchain firms and startups. So as I mentioned before, blockchain and, and that type of technology can be used for other applications as well that aren't uh, purely to do with cryptocurrency. So um, we do see those in Japan as well. So it would be interesting to explore that ecosystem too. Um, we're hoping as well to explore the NFT entrepreneurship in, seen in Japan that exists on, that expands on existing projects that we have where we've um, explored um, some NFT projects too. So we're hoping to uh, look at those as well in, in Japan as well. And finally, in terms of our research questions, so um, when we're actually there, we'll be in a, in a, in a better position to try and understand uh, the broader um, ecosystem of exchanges in Japan. What distinguishes them from each other? How do they work together? How do they compete? Um, how should we understand their role in the global cryptocurrency markets? How is this changing? Um, the roles of the associations in the ecosystem and what are the, low, the long term goals of exchanges, uh, whether this is tax reduction or expansion of the domestic market, ambitions for the international market. Um, and also where, what the customer base looks like. Do they, does it match the data we obtained in our desk research? Uh, how is a customer base for exchanges nurtured in Japan? Um, and so on and so forth. So we also, in terms of the people we want to speak to, we're interested in the CEOs, but also CFOs, uh, chief financial officers, um, chief technical officers, software engineers. Uh, this is to build a more complete image of the expertise within the exchanges, um, so understanding the technical expertise as well that's needed to run an exchange and what it's like from the inside. And related to that question is the question of talent, you know, how is it nurtured in Japan, um, how does this contrast with other parts of the world, and essentially what kind of expertise is needed for an exchange to function in terms of, this covers a lot of things, financial expertise, legal expertise, technical expertise as well. And um, how should we understand more deeply in terms of the regulations, the particularities of the Japanese regulatory system, how it compares to other jurisdictions, and also the particularities of the Japanese tax system is something we're interested in exploring too. And finally, also the question of market making and how is information about markets gathered by exchanges, how do they, how is information gathered and channeled um, by, by exchanges, these are all uh, questions we're hoping to get some data for and questions we're hoping to have some answers for. So I'm sorry we don't have the answers just yet, but that's uh, what we're hoping essentially to 
achieve. And that I think brings me to the end of my presentation. So I'll stop sharing and I think we can switch to uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much. That was, uh, wow, I've learned a lot uh, in a very <laughs> uh, short period of time. Uh, I have lots of questions, so partly some connected directly to, um, you know, sort of questions of fact, others to more anthropological understandings and others to Japan. But um, we have a few participants. Who, um, Michael Leary already had his hand up halfway through the talk. So I think um, we will focus on um, the uh, interaction with the audience first. There's also a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so, um, so in the Q&A box, there's two questions by Imru al Kais Talha Jibril, who asks, uh, you mentioned that Japanese law does not recognize cryptocurrencies as a legal tender. What does it recognize it as legally? Um, and then a follow-up question from the same person. Also, my second question is that Japan was an early adopter of Bitcoin, but do you see it because of regulatory oversight as a late adopter of decentralized finance products? Do you think that the Central Bank of Japan is buying Bitcoin as a reserve currency? Thank you for your presentation. Lots of, lots of very interesting questions there. Um, so my understanding of how uh, the Japanese system um, perceives or defines cryptocurrency. So they don't use the word currency, they, they, they switched it to assets. Um, I think it's, um, I and mean, this is something I would, I'd need to check to be completely sure, but it's, I think it's property. Um, property and as a means of payment. I think that's the, um, that's, that's the main thing. Um, we do hope to be able to speak to people in, um, in, in government as well um, to see it. Well, it, we'd need to be able to get, to get access to see, um, but our hope is, 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 is to be able to sort of hear it kind of directly from, from the horse's mouth as it were. Um, the second question is very interesting. Um, I would say, yes, it's a relatively late adopter of DeFi products. Um, this may or may not be directly related to regulatory oversight, though. I think there are other factors at play. I don't think the I think the regulations don't make it easy for um, for DeFi products to develop um, in Japan, um, simply because I guess they they're aware of the existing infrastructure of the exchanges in Japan, so they are aware that it's. Um, I guess anything touching on cryptocurrency will re will require this type of you know um, AML anti money laundering you know KYC that sort of thing. So you know DeFi products are often quite kind of at least tangentially related to that sort of area. Uh, I mean it depends on the product, but so so I think they'd be quite um, they'd they'd at least have that on their radar because they'd come on they'd probably come under scrutiny. Um, that and it's also a question of the um, the sort of startup landscape in Japan as well, and it it being generally what well, we see the startup landscape kind of often dominated a bit by the U.S., uh, North America, um, in some other parts of the world as well, um, so which tend to be more the kind of the, the 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 edge sort of in terms of how they how how they lead that and DeFi tends to sort of thrive in that environment. Um, so uh, I mean I think you know from the phrasing of your question I think maybe that's you had something like that in mind that it's not sort of purely regulatory oversight. I think it would probably be fair to say um, you know it's a, a a blend really of of things. Um, as for the uh, the buying of Bitcoin, that is something I don't know. So it's it's possible. It's possible, um, and that is something I would uh, I, I I would have to check. Um, I mean, it's certainly the case that pretty much every government in the world is looking at um, you know issuing their own kind of virtual currency. Um, but what that would be essentially would be some it would be a uh, 
it would still be part of a centralized system essentially so it wouldn't really be decentralized because it would be you know belong to centralized finance so they're they're looking to kind of borrow from that technology and that sort of infrastructure to be able to you know to, to do that sort of thing so in you see that in various various stages of development um across across the world so i hope that's uh at least managed to, to, to answer some of those, at least, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, please uh, put your questions either into the Q&A box um, or uh, raise your hand so we can unmute them. But in the meantime, I, I'm gonna ask a much more uh, naive question, uh, perhaps. So I, I remember reading about the hack um, when I was in Japan, and I, I, I was quite surprised in the sense that there wasn't I mean, it wasn't, you know, the, the public reaction wasn't really one of outrage um, or anything. And I was wondering, is this, well, is this, a, is this, could we call this a victimless crime? I mean, is, has somebody actually lost um, their Bitcoins? Because as you said at the very beginning, each blockchain is individual. So how can you steal something? It's it's like the numbers on, 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 a, on a piece of... Um, of currency, isn't it? Couldn't you track mm. down that for from a future transaction? It is possible. So with some of the hacks, what happens is, and this is actually one of the reasons I think why attitudes to it can be a little bit uh, relaxed, is because it is sometimes possible to to track it. Sometimes what happens as well is that people hack it, hack into these exchanges, and uh they, they do it almost for the fun of it and then they return the money afterwards so that does that does actually happen as well so um and i think the other reason why there is less um outrage is because um in part because of the volatility of the exchange rates um people who actually invest in in in, in crypto are often used to just seeing a lot of um, volatility in terms of you know the assets that they actually have so so in a sense they're sort of a little bit um maybe desensitized to these to these mm. to these changes because in in the sort of natural course of um owning these products um you know the see, seeing things change pretty dramatically is is quite normal um so so there is um there is that as well i mean when it comes to the actual sort of technicalities of how they do the hacks i mean that's an interesting question and it's um it, it's 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 not something i know a sort of uh uh tremendous uh, amount about not being sort of software engineer myself i'm not entirely sure how they managed to do it but um but i know that in some cases you can track it down and in some cases it's it's returned and i think what it's done is maybe given a sort of a vaguely, vaguely shady reputation to cryptocurrency mm -hmm. in Japan. But I think because a lot of people are just a bit insulated from it and they, it exists in a way in its own universe. And I think people sort of see it as something over there. And that's, you know, that's not really something that we kind of, uh, you know, that we kind of touch or that we use. So it's, um, it, I think, I think that's possibly why the, the kind of the the actual public reaction was so muted despite it having mm. you know been quite high profile i guess in terms of you know the global in terms of the global perspective on on, on hacks so there's another question um in the uh, q a box um uh, an anonymous attendee writes i'm an interest i'm interested in the field work you plan to do when you are finally able to get to japan do you see this research having a participant observational dimension beyond the interviews? If so, what forms will it take? Um, so that really would be the ideal scenario. So the, the ideal scenario would be to be, um, you know, to be to be based actually in, uh, you know, cryptocurrency exchange or possibly, um, you know, a blockchain firm, a startup firm. Um, this would be something that would have to be, you know, negotiated fairly carefully in terms of access. And that's purely because, um, well, it's related to sort of financial systems and, and, and people being obviously protective of their data and their, their, um, 
uh, their infrastructure as well, and often things you know related to money and finances, and, and is is can be fairly sensitive. So it might be some. It might. It, it depends on people's level of comfort with with COVID as well. So it can be sort of you know in a number of levels. It, it it's it's possibly something that might be quite complicated to negotiate. But on on other levels. Um, might be slightly more straightforward than it would be in a different country because um, in other parts of the world, uh, the um, crypto landscape can be quite distributed. So in terms of not, I mean, not just the system itself, but also how people work. So they could be, you know, in various parts of the globe, there may not necessarily, there, there may be some offices, but whether people are there, you know that that depends, and, and 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 obviously COVID has accelerated that immensely. You know the way people work in a distributed fashion, but Japan tends to have been a little sort of moving a bit less in that direction. So, in terms of the actual places themselves, um, the, it may be possible. So it may be a sort of um, you know if we think of participant observation as kind of classical, you know, classic anthropological. Uh, you know, lens, it, it may have to be something that's possibly partial in terms of what, uh, you know, say, say a cryptocurrency exchange is open to it or a startup is open to it. Um, they may be happy for me to be there for certain things and not others. Uh, and obviously that's, uh, you know, ethically, that's something we take our lead from them for, you know, in terms of what they're, what they're, happy for us to see and, and, and talk about. Um, so yes, that's what we're hoping. That would be really the kind of ideal scenario because obviously we're interested, you know, in their, um, you know, how, how people work in these environments and, you know, how, how do they work together? Who communicates with who? Particularly sort of bridges between types of expertise are very interesting as well because you need technical technical expertise, you need financial expertise to run these things. And, you know, often the logic, you know, may be related to existing forms of expertise, but but may also have to be have to be new and have to be different and have to build on on things in a slightly different way. So actually being able to see people interact and being able to see people, you know, talk and have these conversations really would be in, invaluable because there's um, it, it adds a, you know, a dimension and a richness that in interviews um you know you you can i guess you can really drill down on certain things in interviews but but then participant observation obviously gives you something else as well so yeah that would be ideal yeah i thought immediately thought actually it's not so different from doing um some kind of anthropology of religion right where you observe mm. the people but there, there's something at the center of the whole thing that is not quite manifest that it's not quite there uh, right that, that's talked about and you have ritual specialists who do um all the kind of uh transactions and and to talking to but uh, in that sense i really think participant observation really could give you an insight into you know what what the thing at the center um actually is yeah absolutely. so we had a, sorry we, we we had another question coming through the chat um a very interesting talk. I think that the early adoption of crypto by Japanese people had a lot to do with the apparent inventors named Satoshi. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean it, it's it's um, it's, a, it's a pseudonym, so who knows really? I mean, no one's really managed to get to uh, to the bottom of it, um, but maybe I mean maybe it's it's a, it is as a genuine a genuine Japanese person, but I think it's. Uh, I think it's 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 uh, it may have had a slight you know branding effect possibly for Japanese people. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think you know it's, it's that's, that's that's quite possible as well. Um, yeah, I mean the the, the inventor of Ethereum is a uh, you know he's he's quite high profile. So he's a public figure. So you know he gives talks and he's um, uh, he's a visible visible figure. So it's an interesting contrast actually between the two and. And, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of, uh, of aspects, and it's interesting that you mentioned religion actually just now, Fabio, because there's, um, there's, a, there's an element to uh, cryptocurrency and in, 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 in blockchain, which is almost, I mean, faith would be a strong word to use, but it's like a, 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 a belief in the, the good of the technology and um, 
and you know particularly you know if you if you speak to people who uh who come from countries where you know the government may not be reliable or maybe an active threat to you or the existing um you know infrastructure and the systems are not reliable then 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 um those people will have will will sometimes have quite strong feelings about uh, uh, about blockchain about cryptocurrency as a you know essentially a, a freeing kind of element really and 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 we do see a lot of idealism um you know and when, when we speak to people about uh you know the, the the technology itself there's a there's a real sort of even when it comes actually to different um blockchains people will have loyalties to different blockchains different types of network because of they 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 grow a loyalty to it essentially um and its particular its particularities and what it allows you to do so we see very interesting sort of community formations um sort of crystallizing around technology and you know people forming particular communities very very trusting communities as well surprisingly trusting communities so um it's 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 really fascinating to watch at the sort of the community level as well i think that's but that's really where it's all at right you you have a community that sort of emerges around a particular you could even say an idea Mm -hmm. And that's really, I wanted to to draw you out a little bit on this idea of the non-fungible token as well, because the, you said at the very beginning, the blockchain is, uh, it has an um, individual identification that cannot be, that's unique to it. Um, and that's, it remains identifiable as the thing. Um, and the non-fungible token works in the same way, right? You can, technically you can create an identical copy of like an artwork or a video art or something, but if you don't have the identification to it, um, then it isn't considered to be real. So I was wondering whether there's something about the idea of value that mm. is really quite interesting. I mean, the whole metaphor of mining and sort of suggests, yes, there is some kind of resource extraction going on, but of course there isn't. There is simply, well, the creation of the code is probably um, the creation of value and how that is related to the inalienability precisely because the non-fungible token sort of tries to reproduce in the virtual world this idea of something that only exists once and not twice mm. yeah and this this is um you know it's it it's linked to some pretty sort of core ideas in anthropology i think mm -hmm. and you know if we take sort of nfts for example um you know nfts are really really interesting because to, to my mind, they, 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 they cannot be understood outside of two factors, one of which is social media and the other is speed. And um, so one of the things that really characterizes all the crypto world, investing to a certain extent, but, all, but especially anything to do with NFTs is the sheer speed at which mm. things move. So, um, I'm sure some of you will have heard of, of CryptoPunks. So CryptoPunks being the sort of the first kind of batch of famous, I guess, NFTs that are now, uh, you know, have accrued in, 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 in value immensely. Um, so what you, what you have is in a space of a few years, you know, a handful of years, is these sort of, these, these originals that came in this first wave of NFTs are now considered as having almost historical value. So if you contrast that to the, you know, the existing sort of art world where, you know, often, I guess at least, you know, when you look at sort of historical works of art, it takes a much longer time frame for things to get that kind of value. Uh, with this particular community, I mean, it's fairly small actually, when you consider the number of people who have what you call like a, a you know, a wallet, an Ethereum wallet in which you can, um, sort of store and buy NFTs, um, then it's actually a fairly small number. Um, but in terms of how they've been able to sort of create and generate this this bubble and how they how they they they, they view that essentially with this sort of within this kind of system of of of, um, of value and the speed of that is is very interesting and um, also with social I think I think it's it's it, with NFTs. The link to social media is very strong because it's um, often NFTs 
sort of look look like um, profile pictures, basically. So the you know the circle that you'll have for your Twitter or um, you know your avatar on 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 Discord, for instance. You know you can have that as the NFT. You can have the NFT image there, and that signals to people essentially what what community you belong to in the NFT world, basically. You know which NFT tribe you associate with and they'll often have their associated um channels where people talk about it uh and you know people will back certain projects because they feel strongly about it and often you can be quite close to the creator because they'll be in the channel as well so often these are very short-lived you know they can last three months four months or something like that but but people's sort of feelings about it will be pretty strong and i think it's no coincidence that it sort of you know 2020 Kind of really saw that take off you know and with the with the lockdowns where you know this was this was accelerated and we also have um you know gen gen zers sort of getting into their kind of their their early 20s their mid 20s you know and and really being the kind of driving force behind this we see very interesting things happen with age we see sort of mid kind of older millennials maybe doing a bit more of the trading and then sort of the the younger millennials and the gen z um people kind of more involved in nfts so we see some very interesting age distribution as well um so so some very um and then you know as you mentioned the question of inalienability you know using technology for that you know you the the question of ownership is very strong and that links back to social media and you know having your icon and this is you this is what you own this is what you're communicating to other people so surprising number of links to my previous research with kimonos where you use your kimono <laughs> to show what you like and what you believe in and what you what, what you're about as a person i mean there's i guess there's only a handful of things that human beings do on a, on a regular basis and so it always <laughs> seems to come back to you know to very very similar things about you know our identities or our belief systems and you know how we how we want to spend our money essentially yeah i mean that that i to me, that was a very, uh, really something that surprised me emerging out of the talk that there really are these um, these uh, parallels. There's one more question in the uh, q and I'm going to oh. read that. Are there Japanese and non-Japanese universities in this mix? I wonder how institutions, educational startups may be involved in training and the formation of networks that undergird the human dimension of these firms' communities. So that's a very interesting question. I mean, what we're, um, you know, what we find is that generally speaking, we, we're, you know, in, in, in terms of education, there's, 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 there's yet to be really sort of formalized courses that kind of uh, educate people directly to do with things related to blockchain, you might find and this is an interesting question, actually, because this this you you very quickly get into debates along the sort of should this belong to computer science or should this belong to a business school? Should this be you know under finance? Who who is who 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 should oversee this? You know who are the people who should be teaching this? Um, so so what you see sometimes we've seen this in, in um, actually Hong Kong tends to be one of the places that's the most sort of forward thinking. With these courses so we'll see um you know kind of bridging efforts between sort of say business schools and computer science courses um because often with computer science what we do is sort of we you know we train up software engineers we send them out into the world and they kind of switch careers well no it's not careers but they switch sort of speciality and in industry pretty regularly and you know they may end up in blockchain but they may not be specifically trained for it or things like that so um, we see things like that and then sort of on the social side, the finance side, um, there's, there's, it's still this sort of slightly wild acquisition of knowledge where people do it sort of on their own and they kind of acquire it on the, on, by doing really, you know, a lot of, especially, you know, young people will tell you that as well, you know, Gen Zers will tell you, you know, I just, I just, I just learned by doing it. So you just sort of, you know, you throw yourself into, um, crypto whether that's investing or trading or nfts and you just you just do it essentially often via social media and that's kind of you know so it's it's got this kind of slightly wild sort of frontier vibe to it so the whole thing um 
As for the universities, I mean, they're sort of, uh, you know, maybe with the exception of Hong Kong and some other places too, um, maybe some places in North America as well. Um, it, it's more the kind of level of, of uh, say, um, you know, student groups or um, sort of in, interested kind of individual um, academics uh, as well. So, um, so in terms of this, this question of, of, of education and training is actually one we're quite interested in, in terms of, you know, what we might then say at the end of the project, you know, if we get a chance to um, have a say in advising for policy, you know, that's that sort of thing, because we see this kind of wild, you know, knowledge emerging in, you know, in practice, really people are just learning by doing. And so this, you know, what, what does that mean for kind of formal uh, education and my, my sense of it in Japan is it's sort of a little bit like the UK where it's kind of um, more at the level of kind of student groups rather than actual um, you know courses themselves or training itself I think. hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay I think um, yes um, it is almost uh, 6.30 um, thank you very much for your question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Julie Valk, uh, for giving this really fascinating talk. Um, I think we all learned a lot. I, uh, initially, I thought, oh my God, I'm really not you know, a specialist at all in any of these things, but really the questions that it brings up and the applications are, are extremely important and important for all of us to understand. So thank you very much for that. Um, and it remains for me to say that, yes, do join us again on November 3rd in two weeks time, uh, where we'll go back to materiality uh, perhaps, but also we'll stay with the idea of inalienability because uh, Dr. Benedetta Lomi from Bristol University will talk about body like withered wood and heart like dead ashes, reconfiguring the remains of Kamatari statue at Tornomine. So, um, you can see there is actually an underground connection that connects uh, all of these talks. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you to our presenter and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much for having me.